Okay, I think we're going to start. So welcome everybody um, to this ACVSM kind of evening webinar that's kind of entitled A Day in the Life of, and we're going to hear about kind of a day in the life of two sports physiotherapists, um, Liam Newton and Laura Hanna, um, and they're going to describe kind of a typical day in the life of in two environments. Um, and then after that, oh, let me just check my slide. There we go. Um, oh, apologies there, IT. There we go. So um, let me introduce myself briefly first. My name's Colin Patterson. I currently am on the executive committee of the ACPSEM um, and also sit on the International Sports Physiotherapy Group, the IFSBT. And kind of my day job, as this is probably primarily aimed at students, is I work at Brighton University. So I'll kind of be chairing this evening webinar. And I've just got a couple of slides intro before we will initially start with Liam, um, who's going to talk around his a day in the life of his work in a football academy. And then we're going to follow that up with hearing about a day in the life of Laura Hanna from a kind of an Olympic multi-sport game environment and then when we've heard both talks then we'll open up um, to some Q&A and some question opportunity. Hopefully you can see if you hover your your mouse across the screen or you've seen it there's a, a Q&A option um, so we'd quite like you to put any questions you have um, either to specifically Liam or Laura or both of them in the question section rather than the chat box um, and then when you're kind of in that area it's worth having a little look at and you can kind of almost like questions that other people have written and they kind of then get bumped up the list and that will just help us maybe identify the questions that we start with so do keep an eye on that um, and the questions other people have asked and probably just the one bit of housekeeping just to help with everyone's kind of bandwidth is we can just make sure your cameras are off and that your sound is muted um, so that um, that doesn't interfere with anything um, and also kind of need to, before we start, very much thank Physique, um, who are a company that I know I've used over the years a lot and a, a lot of sports physios do for supporting um, us this evening, kind of using their Zoom and helping us promote and kind of sponsor this evening. So thank you to Physique um, for doing that and working with us. So be kind of for we start, I suppose I really want to just kind of mention I should say maybe remind people that we do have a kind of a professional development pathway um, that's very much designed at supporting people to kind of develop their expertise in the sporting context so as a sports physiotherapist um, so you might be familiar we have different levels bronze silver gold and they very much are designed around encouraging you to do things in a if you like a good way to develop your sports physio career so there's different requirements relating to how much you use reflective practice any specific courses you need to do shadowing experiences and etc and at the higher level it requires a, a postgraduate masters um, and we very much look at your learning to do with some competencies that the international sports physiotherapy group put together um, which you can have a look at it's a relatively large document um, and it's on their website www.ifsbt.org um, and it just highlights these um, different competencies that there are. So there are these 11 competencies and within the areas it kind of details different bits of knowledge or skills that a sports physiotherapist should be looking to develop. So it's really just a flag that there are some resources out there for you to have a look at um, and there is this pathway as well and this just is a bit of a summary slide to the different levels but you'll see that even at the low level in terms of the bronze level which is often the first level people People try and achieve there's kind of a requirement to go out there and get some supervision and shadow people working in sport do a sports first aid course some other kind of 
useful CPD courses um, and to kind of start using your reflective practice relating to sport and then the different requirements go up there but there's certainly more information on our website and I'm sure um, and I think Leon's talk kind of touches on elements of this pathway as well so it's really just a flag that it is there for those potentially students or if you're kind of an early career physiotherapist um, it's definitely worth having a look at in terms of guiding what you might do to develop your expertise in this area um, but that's enough of me just giving a little bit of a background so I'm going <clears> to <throat> first of all introduce um, Liam who's going to be our first speaker um, Liam is in fact one of our regional reps for the sports physio and sport group and he also sits on our education committee so um, while he currently works at Southampton Football Club which is what we're going to hear about today in terms of his a day in the life of Liam's also currently doing his MSc in sports physiotherapy and has worked in other sporting contexts and roles before which I'm sure we'll hear about so I will hand over to Liam I will unshare my screen and let Liam Thanks very much, Colin, for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for giving up your time to tune in to this evening. Um, I hope you find it useful, and as Colin said, in the next 30 minutes or so, I hope to give you a bit of an insight into to, to where I am currently, um, what a day looks like for me, um, the journey that I've been on to get where I am, um, and yeah, I hope it's of, of some use. So. I thought I'd start off with saying what not to expect from my talk. And the first is I'm not going to present any graphs that show exponential growth um, of a virus. I'm also not going to show any graphs that show predictive modeling of a virus. And I hope I'm also not going to say next slide, please. Um, so into business, um, what to expect? Well, I think a little bit about me. We'll go through that. What a typical day is like for me. Um, what I feel like key interactions are for me and key skills for me um, and then a few things around what I found works for me and, and what I think are general skills to work in sport. Um, so to begin, I, before I was a physio, I did a sport and exercise science degree from Nottingham Trent University and found that really, really interesting, really useful, um, but towards the end of the course felt like my interest was strongly in the exercise and, and physio, well, rehab and, and then physiotherapy was, was the career I wanted to pursue. So I was lucky enough to get on to the pre-reg masters at Birmingham University that ran January to December, two years, um, full time, quite intense, but really enjoyed it. Um, and then that was my sort of qualification as a physio. Um, and then, as Colin mentioned, last year, I started the part-time sports physio master's from Bath University, and I've just started the second year of that. Um, cool. So my experience, I finished uni and then went straight into the NHS. Um, I took a, a band five static MSK role, which was uh, GP referrals, orthopedic referrals, um, and I had a really, really good supervisor there, I had some wonderful experiences being challenged in different ways, different patients, uh, different communication styles, different demands, different constraints from financial perspective. Um, and I felt like it was a really good place for me to practice my physio skills that I'd learned in uni, in the real world. And I also felt like um, it gave me a really good grounding and, and mileage of seeing patients that I feel like I may not have got um, if I'd gone straight into sport. Um, however, I used that opportunity to try and gain as many sporting experiences as I could around the, the NHS work. When I was in Birmingham, um, during my master's, I managed to get a contact to Warwickshire. So I uh, did some work for them with the cricket team, covering some games and helping with some injury injury like rehabs. Um, I managed to get a weekend role at Bournemouth, just doing some pitch side first aid stuff, um, again, in a professional environment, which was a nice insight. Um, I managed to do a couple of books events. So obviously, I'm sure there's many students on this call. Um, there are a number of opportunities for physios to get involved supporting these events. Um, I haven't done a lot of them, but I've done a couple and they were, again, was a really good experience um, just to see 
uh, a day where there's so many different sporting events being covered and different sporting demands. Um, enjoyed that. Um, I was lucky to get an opportunity to work at the Indoor European Championships in Birmingham, which was, um, again, a, a really different experience being based in a hotel, um, just sort of supporting some of the countries that didn't have um, their own physios. Um, again, another interesting experience. Um, towards the end of my time in the NHS, I managed to get a role in cricket with the Sun Vipers, which is the one of the franchise teams in, in women's cricket. Um, and we got to the final and lost the final. The year before they won it and the year after I was there, they won it. So probably no coincidence that me being there was probably not the, the best thing for them. Um, so I did just over two years in the NHS and then a opportunity came to work in cricket and I took that role, which was a full-time role, my first full-time role in sport, and that was um, assisting the lead physio and he, he oversaw the first team squad. I assisted him with the first team squad and then led the academy. Um, and through this period, I'd, I'd started to gain a little bit of experience in sport, as you could see. And I felt like I wanted to try and put a, a bit of formal plan together for my learning. Um, and that's where I came a lot across the, the physios and sport pathway. Um, so I'll touch on a little bit more detail in a moment, but uh, I managed to get my bronze award um, while I was at Hampshire. And sort of linked to this part of my plan, I, I realised I was probably underskilled in some of the sports trauma side of things because for those of you not aware of cricket, uh, pitch side, it's pretty gentle. There's very little trauma. Um, and, and wanting to work in sport, I felt like this was an area of weakness of mine. And I thought no better way to get better trauma skills was to work in rugby. Um, so I managed to seek a role with, uh, actually with one of the band seven physios that I worked with in the NHS, ran his local rugby team. So it was a really good environment to work in a supportive way um, with the first team of, of the semi-pro rugby club get to see some different injuries, but also trying to develop that skill that I'd found that I was probably weakest at to help me uh, moving forward in my career. Um, so I did two full years doing that, uh, rotating through the winter and summer. And then I was really lucky last year, I managed to get a full-time role at Southampton Football Club. Um, so I'm academy physio there, which is I'm predominantly uh, oversee the nines to sixteens programme and then assist um, within the older ages as required. My day-to-day -day is with the schoolboys, um, and my primary responsibility will be the 14s and 15s, and then we'll, I'll oversee some of the other age groups or assist with some of the other age groups. Um, and as I said, I've been there a year now, which I'm really lucky to, to be. Um, and I think I wanted to say at this point is if we've got students and some early professionals is I don't think there's a perfect way I don't think there's a right way to, to get into sport I think I've met people along the journey that have gone straight into sport that took years um, working in different settings before they came into sport and I think there's multiple pros and cons of each one and I think different circumstances different situations you can get different things from but I think the key for me is probably applying yourself along that journey um, and sort of linked to that and you you see maybe from Colin's slide earlier, my bias is I, I am a part of the ACPSEM and I think that's, well, that's partly because I, I believe it's a really good organisation and for those working in sport, I think to get involved in it and, and to seek uh, interest from your regional reps and um, some of the events that we have on is really key for, for your development. And I think the pathway is for me has played a really important part in my development and, and that's why I, I go on to talk about it now and I think if you are thinking about it or if you are unsure of should you do it is it going to help me I work in a team sport I work in NHS is it going to help me then I'll go through a few things that I've found that's helped me and, and hopefully you can take some of that away with you um, so firstly I think for me it's helped me give me a focused and directed learning plan so it's given me some structure to what I wanted to do and, and identify areas of my sports physio learning to try and develop. Um, 
you go through the, the, the pathway, you need to get a mentor and obviously gaining a mentor for me was really, really important. And I, I was lucky enough to get a really, really experienced physio um, to, to mentor me and somebody that I speak to quite a bit still now. And he gave me a lot of help and support away from the environment that I was in. So I felt like I could be as impartial and as honest with him about how I was feeling with say different cases or my skills. And he was, yeah. And he's a, a really important person in my development. Um, gave me a, a formal process to my learning experience because we go through a process of learning uh, as part of our professional regulations. Um, but this gave us a, gave me a bit of structure and a bit of a focus. Um, and I felt like if I'm going to be doing the CPD, if I'm going to be reading things, if I'm going to be listening to podcasts, webinars, why not try and get something from it? Try and get a, re- a formal qualification, a formal um, recognition for doing that CPD. Um, as I say, it gave me a plan. So for, for one year, I had a structured plan that things I was going to try and improve on or get exposed to. Um, and then that was reviewed. And then we, we did that again. Um, so the bronze level is the entry level um, uh, pathway. And they generally think it's worth around two years postgraduate experience to be um, trying to attain this. Uh, as you can see there from the screen, a couple of key things to to think about going towards it is, is getting some experience, shadowing experience, ideally with somebody. I think that's really important. I found having a supportive environment to get the shadowing in has been key. Um, a first aid certificate, some taping, um, CPD, and then some really important things, I think, course reflections and, and how that maybe helps you in your job, and then some critical incidents of things that you've done um, and things that you've learned as a result of, of practices. Um, and then the last thing, why did I do it? Well, probably to get some street cred. There was me thinking, if I go through this path, I'm going to get a bronze medal, I'm going to get a gold medal at some point. I can be walking down the street looking like this man. Physios are going to be thinking, wow, this guy's amazing. Got the CPD bronze certificate. I didn't feel like that at all. But in my head, I was like, this is what I'm going to look like. And then the next day I went into work and nobody cared. <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that's um, what it's about. So I thought before going into a week, uh, a day, I'd give you a perspective of what a week is so you can see what a day would be like. And this is a typical week. Um, if we start on a Monday, so a Monday would be an, a non-clinical day, um, admin focused, planning different rehabs for the week, um, planning uh, some of the injury stuff with different members of the interdisciplinary team. Um, we have a, an army of part-time staff who we uh, have to arrange for help with clinics in the evening and game day. So that all takes place on Monday, also helping with potentially some of the different age groups. Um, we Tuesday would generally be a little bit of planning in the afternoon and then the players would come in late afternoon and then into the evening. Wednesday, Thursday would be a day release. So they'd be with us all day, education and football. Uh, Friday um, would be an, an afternoon day release. So they'd go to school in the morning and then come late afternoon into the evening. Saturday would be off and then Sunday would be our game days. So we we're a category one academy, which means, which is why we get so much contact with the players. Obviously, at the minute, that's not the case, but this would be a normal, normal week. Um, so a typical day for me generally would start around eight o'clock and that would uh, involve a, a catch up with the MDT, particularly the coaching staff and strength conditioning guys um, around what's happened the previous day and what we're looking at today, just recapping the final plans and timings. Um, I think here flexibility is really, really important. We know that things can change quite quickly. Um, also, first thing I'd try and catch up with some of the players as they're arriving, just to get a bit of an insight to how they're feeling, how are they from the previous day or the weekend. And that allows me to get a gauge of, of how the rest of the day is going to go. Generally their day would start with a debrief. Um, so, the squad would get together with the coach and chat through the weekend's game. Um, at Southampton, we have um, streams of focus for our physical curriculum. One of those is prevent, uh, prevention of injuries. And myself and the strength conditioning coach lead those sessions. So we would have a focus 
of a particular area, a particular injury that we're trying to prevent. And we would go through a half an hour session with them, um, going through a range of drills um, to help with that. Uh, the players would then leave us and they would go and have a psychology session. Uh, they could sometimes be in the classroom um, or on the pitch, mindfulness, um, different things like that. Really, really interesting. Um, so then we'd move into the team training session. Um, so the fit players would go off and they would train. We'd be on a, a radio communication with the coaches and the strength conditioning team. If there was any injuries or emergencies, we'd, we'd be able to go out on, on the boogie and, and tr treat those. Um, and then this for me would be first day of day release of the week would be an opportunity to assess the injured players um, and then start with their rehab. So it would be the, the first point of my clinical journey for that week and um, get an understanding of where they are and then starting with the, the rehab for the week. Um, generally at, at that time we would go through, have lunch, um, debrief a little bit with the coaching staff and then um, uh, move on to S&C session. So I think it's really important as a physio I'm around that and, and can assist with that because I think being able to see them in the gym or on the pitch with um, how they move, I think it's really important. And obviously there's such a close interlap with, with us. Um, and there potentially might be an injured player that can be involved in that and can be around the rest of the team that we could modify that potentially I would then close, more closely watch them during the S&C um, or assist with that. They would then go into education for a few hours where they do their schoolwork. Um, and at the end of the day, they would have another training session and we'd carry on with another injury session. So if you can see from that week, there's going to be multiple days like this. So trying to plan and periodize what they do, they don't just go through the motions in their morning session and their afternoon session doing the same stuff, planning and making sure that they're, they're, they're targeting different energy systems, potentially or different areas um, during these different sessions is really important to get the most out of it. Um, I've put their 5.30 finish, rarely finishes at 5.30, um, things drag on or you've got parents to speak to or coaches um, there would be an evening clinic with potentially a different age group that would come in and we'd have part-time staff with that then we'd hand over any of the injuries to them let them know uh, what to expect what the plan is for those players um, so I think what's really important to say is working in sport you are a small piece of a much bigger picture and as you can see in that top right corner, in the international and professional sport nowadays, you're seeing such a big backroom staff. And it's not just uh, the coach, sports scientist, physio. There's a, such a big department that you can draw on and have amazing skills. And we're quite lucky, or I feel quite lucky at Southampton to have such a, a breadth of expertise on hand uh, for us. I think key relationships for me, I've got those arrows there the sports science staff and the coaching staff us three um, are in constant communication and work really, really closely planning the week. And I feel very lucky to have a forward thinking coaching staff who are very inclusive of, of science and medicine and, and are looking at really how can they get the best out of that player, whether they're injured or fit. Um, equally, we, I could go around this circle and just key interactions really important um, relationship with the doctor when we're managing the more significant injuries. Nutritionists have a really important role in preventing injury. If we've got a long-term injury, looking at some of the players' nutrition to make sure they don't put, any on, put on an, any extra weight, really, really important to draw on that. The analysts can be so important for when they're injured, they've got a lot of time out, being able to draw upon them to come up with some tasks to look at maybe some of their technical development. Um, and stop them getting bored when they're missing football. It's a good way for them to still feel like they're involved with some analysis tasks. Player welfare, another important department that can help um, often with injured players, making sure that their welfare is as good as it should be, really important. Psychology, again, from both a performance and uh, injury rehab point of view, I think they give us some really insightful bits of knowledge um, and can really help on that player's journey. As, as I said, we, we are lucky to have teachers with us on site. So, again, it's an important relationship, making sure that teachers are feeding back any bits and bobs of information they've noticed about the player and vice versa. 
Um, and as I said, sports science, really important in our planning of the week and some of our rehab. And again, you can have the best plan in the world, but if you can't get that across with your coaching staff and deliver it, um, it's useless. So what does it take to work in sport? I think a work ethic is really, really important. You, you will do lots and lots of hours, lots of antisocial hours, weekends. You'll miss a lot of things. You'll miss a lot of social events. And having that drive to continually turn up, be the first one there, the last one out, uh, I think it's really important. Understanding the sport, I think that goes a long way to help you in your practice, but also I think it's really important in your buy-in with the players. I think if, if you at least try to understand the sport, the players will really respect that. And um, I think it's, it's really important. One of the biggest things for me, I think, is communicating well with players and staff. We are a small part of that big cog um, and putting the player at the middle and getting the communication right I think is really important and um, having no ego I think is again really important if an athlete's succeeding rarely is it due to us we're a, a very small cog in that wheel um, it's not about us we're not in sport for us to live the fame it's about the players they're the one that do the hard work take things personally many a time I've been in my previous role abused being the referee in the morning of a football game the cricketers used to love it and I would get so much abuse um, but I would never take it personally I know it was just their way of starting the day or well, that's what anyway I thought they were doing <laughs> um, and but no, no it was a good way to get the boys going get them um, active and I think um, don't th take things too personally showing you care I think it's really important for the players and the staff um, I think that's a really good way to get some respect um, and I think being, having perspective and a level head, I think it's really important when we win and we're doing really well, let's not get too carried away. And when somebody's losing and we're, we're, we're not doing well, I think it's hard to not be downbeat. Let's, let's get everybody back up again. Um, I just wanted to go through a couple of um, maybe less well-known areas of, of sport and some of the, the other side of things. And this is a really good blog I, I would recommend you have a little read of of just some of the non-clinical things. Um, and I think in sport, we're always balancing this performance. We want people to perform at 100% to do really well. Um, we're trying to maximise performance. And often that is weighed against safety. And we obviously play a key role there in trying to maximise performance, but not jeopardise um, players' safety. And I think in professional sport, is different to uh, healthcare in terms of we see a dual duty of care with medical practitioners obviously have a duty of care to their player um, and also the club have a duty of care to the player through the health and safety at work act so that we see this dual duty of care and I've got this up here to try and explain it um, so we see between the medical practitioner the doctor the physio and the athlete we have this duty of care confidentiality with them um, um, and in sport obviously we're employed by the the club so we're responsible we report to the club um, and obviously we've got to respect confidentiality of the athlete um, but also we need to communicate important medical information uh, on the employee to the employer of the ability to safely work um, and often we'll be discussing quite important sensitive medical information with the employer um, who are non-medical staff. So it's important that we understand and you understand as a practitioner what you can and can't um, disclose to them. And I think that's a, a really interesting area. Um, and then also we've got this relationship, as I said, between the athlete and the employer, where the employer also has to um, sort of take appropriate steps to mitigate risk for the athlete. Um, what would I say the big challenges are? Well, I think um, long hours, as I said, often we're the first ones in in the morning, getting in early to try and plan the day. Uh, and you want to see everybody through from a medical point of view. You can't often leave site until the game or training is finished um, and everybody's left safely. Um, the big frustration is last minute changes to schedule. So you, you'll think you're off and then something changes and you're on and then all your plans have to change. Um, also, you might have this perfectly planned rehab program for the day, periodized plan for the week all of a sudden the fixture changes and then it's all up in the air and the coach is asking you, are they ready today? You were thinking three days ago, uh, three days ahead, they'd be ready. So it's just being flexible with that. Often I think in sport, we can be underpaid. I think it's a highly um, lucrative area in terms of there's a lot of people that want to work in it. 
and as a result, employers can uh, squeeze us. Um, and I think often that's a shame. Uh, I think a really important area is managing conflict. Often there is conflict, both from the player, from the employer, potentially a third party, a parent, an agent, et cetera, who may have um, some hidden agendas. They might, might want something that they're being quite sneaky about and you've got to deal with that as well as dealing with what's best for the player um, in an appropriate way. And I think also in sport, we see this decision-making and pressure um, on decisions. And I think knowing a little bit about yourself and how you act and how you think is really important because if you're tired or stressed, if you're not having a good day, how is that going to change you and your decisions and how you think? And is that going to negatively or positively affect, affect the team? Um, another area I think is important is obviously your physio. So having a sound musculoskeletal knowledge and experience base is important. I said earlier about the like, clinical mileage. The more people you see, the more experience you're going to get. Um, I think that's really important. Exercise prescription, obviously, I think it's our bread and butter and, and being really good at some of the basics, I think it's really important. Of course, some adjuncts are really important to have up your sleeve at times to, to get somebody through or to, to offer a different perspective. Uh, I think they're really important and it can be of high value. Um, pitch side training, I think in sport, you've got to be good. You've got to be competent. You've got to be sort of safe with your pitch side work. So, so making sure you've got a pitch side course is really important. But I think the biggest thing I could say is practicing that. There's a huge amount of detraining that happens when you finish your course and you've got your certificate. So track training and practicing and re-reading re some of your course notes is really important for that. Um, appreciating the sport in demands, I think is really important. Uh, and what I would say is feel it. So go in, do some of the drills that the players do, do some of the tasks they do to really feel what, what's being loaded here, what's being worked hard, what, so then when you're prescribing that or you're trying to get somebody back, you've got a really good understanding of, of what's needed and what it takes. Um, I think we're not going to get a huge amount of respect if you're saying, do this, do this, do this. And the players can't see that you can appreciate how tough or, or how, how hard that is. Um, I think being a team player is really important. We are a team. And as you hear, the, the best teams are when everybody's working together, pulling towards that one common goal. And I think, as I said, working in sport, it's not about you. It's about the team and, and the players to make sure that they're in the best position to do the, the best they can. Um, now, this was a, a recent paper that came out last year, I think. Um, and for me, I thought it was a really, really nice paper that sort of encompassed a, a number of things that help us go from when we come out of uni and we're a student, and we're novice, full of enthusiasm to to where, where we want to be, which is that expert physio. And I think that doesn't happen by chance. It happens with a lot of hard work. And I think, importantly, a plan. We know we plan so many other things in our life. And I think to be a good sports physio, we've got to have a plan of our sports physio skills. Um, and this is a picture taken from that um, paper. You can see they break down... Um, sort of learning to three areas, technical, creative, and contextual. And I think they're three really important areas to, to think about with your learning. Are you really good at your technical learning? Is that, are you really strong there? But then you're neglecting two other areas that I think are really important. Your creative learning, which is ability to adapt, uh, apply things to case studies to, to people in front of you. Your self-directed learning that you'll go on to, to learn that will then help your clinical reasoning. And then I think a really important part is that contextual learning. So being able to learn from your experiences, uh, problem solve and uh, adapt your approach to different environment people. W would you treat and manage a rehab a certain case the same with a different player of a different age or a different ability or a different background? Um, so it's so all these th other things that I think are outside that can I do a McMurray's test really nicely? Do I understand the latest research around hamstring research? brilliant but if you can't get that through and you can't communicate that you're going to be struggling so just carrying on a little bit around the non-clinical skills which you, you're probably sick to death of me explaining or um something that i found was really important for me a few years ago i attended an even lecture by jason laird there who's british gymnastics physio 
excuse me, and he did a talk around like the the non-clinical and the clinical skills for physios working in sport. And he has actually since done a talk for physios in sport on this area. Um, so if you are a member, you can see that in the members area. And I would highly recommend you have a look at that. And I think understanding different types of communication is important and, and planning how you would deliver your communication. So I would never previously have thought about how I would deliver some news to a coach or a player and planning that I think is a really important thing. Um, and Jason talks really nicely about how you can do that. Uh, being flexible, um, you, you've got to understand how you communicate and you've potentially got to mould that to get the best out of the situation. Personality types, and there are lots of them, and different organisations do different things. And understanding what you are as a personality type and what your players and coaching staff is is really important for you to learn or for you to get the best out of how you communicate with others. Um, so, in summary, I think be a positive influence. I would like to hope I've been a positive influence in the roles that I've had. And often when you're touring or you're with a team on a long season, they can mood and, and morale can fluctuate. And I think if you can be that person that's really positive and uh, brings the energy to the team, um, that'll go a long way. Again, I think I've said quite a few times, it's not about you. It's about the team and about the players you, you're treating. Um, I think something that I've really focused on in the last couple of years has probably been more of my non-clinical skills that I think are probably even more important in sport than they would be in, in the NHS um, or a clinic-based um, environment. I don't think there's a perfect route into sport. As I said earlier, there's many ways you can get in, but I think having a plan is so important. Uh, and then I just wanted to touch on this last bit here that I think looking after your own physical and mental well-being is really important. Often we're in an environment where we're always looking after others and people are always coming to us when they're not well. Um, so making sure you find time to look after yourself is really important in the sport or in an industry that is very demanding. Um, and the last bit of advice I think would be find a mentor. I think that's really important. Um, my email address is down there and my Twitter's there. If you want to get in contact with me, I'm more than happy to um, get back to you. I promise anybody that gets in touch with me, I will get back to. It might not be straight away, but I've been given many helps along the way and I think it's important that I help other people. Um, so good luck and enjoy the journey. Thank you very much for listening. And as I said, if, if you would like to ask any questions, I'll be happy to answer those at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam, for that. Um, and like Liam says, we're going to take questions at the end. So do keep adding some questions into that Q&A option that you've got next to chat. Um, and you can also do a thumbs up um, on questions that you would kind of you like. Um, and so the more thumbs up a question has, we might well go to those ones first. So um, so definitely keep putting your questions down there. We've already got some really great questions. So we'll definitely come to those afterwards and and I think yeah thanks Liam for kind of setting the scene around some of the different skills and knowledge and kind of factors to do with the environment that um, sports physios work in and I think I probably didn't say at the beginning but that's really one of the the aims of this kind of evening webinar aimed at students kind of early career physios to kind of set the scene and get you thinking around how is sport different or how what do I need to look to develop and, and to give you a bit of an insight into the the different environments environments that a physio works in so thank you for that Liam I'm just going to um, share my screen again briefly although I don't really need to so I get to introduce when my slide changes not Liam again you'll be glad to know um, although brownie points for Liam for quoting my article in BGSM so that's always a um, it's noted so thank you Liam um, from that point of view and it was this year in BGSM so I now have the pleasure of introducing Laura Hanna who um, I'm lucky to say is a friend of mine as well as a, a work colleague so I've had the pleasure of working with Laura on many occasions as well so um, 
we haven't got all day to kind of talk about Laura's CV, but I can summarise a few bits that Laura actually is a, one of the few life members of Physio in Sport. And that basically means she spent a long time working on the committees um, over the many kind of years in the past and is still actually one of our taping tutors for anyone who, when COVID um, hopefully starts to disappear and we're able to start doing our in-person courses again, um, Laura is one of our taping tutors. Um, but Laura has a huge amount of experience of working in sport um, for a long time and is currently a self-employed physio consultant working within kind of a number of different national governing bodies um, and is currently kind of the performance lead for Team GB for their preparation camp um, when hopefully the Olympics takes place um, next year now 21 um, and Laura is obviously going to kind of give us an insight into a day in the life of um, working at a, a multi-sport games because um, Laura's um, been able to work um, in five Olympics either as a sport specific or an HQ role so um, amongst Commonwealth Games and bits like that so she's going to give us a really great insight I'm sure into what it's like working in a slightly different environment again to the, the football environment that Liam's talked about. Brilliant um, firstly thank you ACPSCM for inviting me um, and thank you Liam I was really found that really interesting um, and very well put together a uh, presentation. So I'm going to talk to you about a day in the life of an Olympic physio. Um, firstly, Colin has done a very good job of introducing me, but um, I would like to reinforce some of the things Liam did with his career um, that, that I did. And as, as he quite rightly says, there is various ways to actually become a sports physio. Um, I've been qualified for 33 years so that's probably older than most of you um, and I have worked in full-time sport for the last 19 but my first 10 years I worked in the NHS and I, I thought the work and the services and the support and the CPD that I got in the NHS has, has held me in good stead for all of my working career. It gave me lots of exposure to different I worked at a teaching hospital, so, so it was a big teaching hospital, but it gave me a lot of exposure to lots and lots of pathology. I worked initially as a rotating band five, so I rotated around many, many disciplines um, for two years, some of which you may not think are particularly relevant for sport, but um, you know, I, c I can count on many, many hands how many times I've actually treated a chest at a major games. Um, without doing respiratory, which you know, I have to hold my hands up and said I really didn't enjoy. Um, you know, it has held me in good stead in terms of you know being able to treat a chest, being able to re-educate breathing patterns when they're under stress, being able to percuss asthma prevention, and all things like that, which you initially don't think of when you first go into sport. So I would encourage people to get as wide a range as they possibly can within their circumstances. And I know, you know, some jobs in the NHS may not be forthcoming, but if you can't get them, try and get some exposure elsewhere. Um, after working in the NHS and, and during working in, in the NHS, I actually um, started working in sport and I worked at a local rugby club um, and a local netball team. Um, my ambition was to go to an Olympic Games and I did apply unsuccessfully to go to the 1986 Olympic Games um, but was told that my experience wasn't wasn't re relevant enough and, and of a of a higher um, elite status. So I actually had to rethink about what I was doing and whether I stayed in rugby and netball or whether I moved on. And I decided to move on and I moved into judo, which you could argue is a bit like the front five in rugby. But and there are lots of similarities. But, um, you know, I changed my tack because I was aiming for something to get to and I needed that I, I needed I realized I had to change it so I've been very privileged to um been able to attend Olympic Games I've attended five next year will be my sixth um I've also like Liam I've worked in the Bucks um environment again some great experience with some great mentoring um Bucks allow students to come in and shadow and you just need to actually contact the Bucks lead physio and they'll be able to tell you how you can get onto their shadowing program. 
And I certainly found that very, very valuable. And that gave me my first exposure to a multi-sport event, which was, and a multi-sport event is, as it says on the can, lots of sports taking place at the same time, at the same venue. Um, and you get to ex experience and be exposed to many of them. It also gave me my first overseas multi-sport um, event, which was the World University Games, which is a fantastic event, very similar to Commonwealth Games and Olympic Games. And in terms of participation, is only second to the Olympic Games. So, um, you know, participation at World University level is actually vast and they have a, you know, a massive multi-sport event every two years um, worldwide. So, uh, you know, I've been very, very privileged. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to try and do is explain how you get to these places and what sort of skills and not dissimilar to what Liam has described, um, you need to be able to, um, you know, firstly, re be recruited and secondly, enjoy doing it because there's nothing worse than aiming for something, get there and then really hate it. And I, you know, I have known people do that. It's not what they think it is. And, um, and it's, you know, their, their journey has ended there. So this is me. Now, when I was asked to describe Olympic physios, in my mind's eye, um, an Olympic physio is a physio that has worked at an Olympics, as simple as that. So there are three main ways a physio can work at Olympic Games. And these, these are the three. And bearing in mind, we're talking about Team GB. So everything will be um, tailored to Team GB because that, that's what my experience has been. So the three, the three main ways physiotherapists can work um, and the Olympic Games is as part of Team GB headquarters staff, and I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by each of these in a minute. Um, as part of Team GB sports specific staff, and what I mean by staff is physios, and as part of the organising committee physios. And definitely in the latter years, pretty much since London 2012, and because of Glasgow 2014, and obviously with the up and coming Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in 2022, a lot more physios have had the chance to be able to work for the sort of the games organizing committee. And this is a fantastic experience. Um, and I would encourage those of you that are near qualification, or even those of you that are still a student, you may not be able to work as a physio, but you could work as a volunteer at some of these games in our country and it'll, it'll, it'll give you masses of, of experience um, in terms of where you want to go and what you want to do. So they're my three. I'm very quickly, well, not that quickly actually, but I'm going to go through the three different types and some of the things associated with it and how you would apply or, or get on the pathway to be able to, to uh, fulfill some of these roles. So Team GB headquarters physios, for those of the, you that don't know, Team GB, along with Team England, Team Scotland, Team Wales at the Commonwealth Games, they will all have a centralised medical setup. It's an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team that the, the team set up within the Athletes Village that is um, – available to all the athletes and the staff members of their team. It usually occupies a space. It could be a, one of the flats. It could be porter cabins. It, there's a various ways that it can happen. But the actual Team GB or the British Olympic Association who run Team G, GB, sorry, will set up this, this multi or interdisciplinary um, uh, medical centre. And the disciplines that are usually more commonly in it are physios, doctors, psychologists, nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches, sports scientists. Um, these are available, as I said, to all of the Team GB. That's Team G GB staff as well as athletes. In able to do this, it's a recruited role. So you have to, you have to apply. The, um, the job advertisements are usually um, on the BOA website, UK Sport website. Um, it will be in some of the home country institutes websites, so the English Institute of Sport, Welsh Institute of Sport, Scottish Institute of Sport, um, and you apply. And the recruitment process is a formal process, um, usually involving at least a face-to-face -face panel interview, but also more commonly 
a whole day's interview. And one of the reasons why they're doing this, and it, it has developed. So when I first, um, my first Olympics, I was, I was privileged enough to go to Sydney in 2000 as a TGB HQ physio. Um, and the interviews then were basically face to face. But as research and some of the research and some of the work that Nikki Phillips has done about recruiting and soft, I call it soft skills, but it's non-clinical skills, have found to be very important when you build a team. And the reason why they're important is you build this team and the team has to gel and react and work very quickly because you don't get much time to actually do all the nice, nice stuff beforehand and gradually build a team. So, for example, if we were, if you were being recruited for the Olympic Games, say the Olympic Games was in in summer, summer next year, um, if it was a normal Olympic cycle, ignore the fact that it's been delayed, you may not actually get recruited um, into the team until the summer before. Now you think, oh, that's a year, a year we can gel as a team. But bearing in mind our contact days before we actually get out there and work together for, it can be six weeks solidly, maybe something like four days. So you have to try and build a team and make people allow people to work together allow people to be their best in four days which is a is a big big um ask so they're very very careful when they're recruiting and they do take into account clinical skills obviously um but also the non-clinical or soft skills it's you know how do you how do you cope are you empathetic are you flexible you know, are you a, a good person to be around? Are you really moody? If you're really moody, are you going to, you know, cause friction within the team? Because the last thing you want to do is have somebody who is living with somebody, because you do share rooms, no single rooms, it's all shared rooms. Um, you're working possibly eight hours a day, every day for six weeks, and people are going to get tired. People are going to, you know, have pressures. They're going to have pressures being away from home. They're going to have pressures being away um, for so long, away from their loved ones and friends. Um, and, you know, if you don't get on, it could be a disaster. So re the recruitment has developed into quite a long process with lo lots of multifactual things in. So your clinical skills are important, but as Liam said, so are the non-clinical soft skills. So it is worth having a look at, you know, what sort of things they're looking for. So you'd be recruited to this role and it will be a bespoke multi or interdisciplinary team, which will be delivering to Team GB. OK, the actual service provides service to the national governing body. So NGBs are national governing bodies. So um, the Team GB is made up of many national governing bodies. Um, and each has their own plan and each are used to traveling and each are, com are used to competing at a single sport event. So this is, you know, this is a vast multi-sport event where many small teams come together as one team. And one of the strap lines that T Team GB try and facilitate is one team. So although you're small teams within your disciplines, we are big one big team. So the actual medical services provide um, sole practitioner um, services to some national governing bodies. So some of the smaller national go governing bodies that only qualify a few athletes may not have the capacity to actually bring their own medical staff with them. So if that's the case, then the hepatitis <coughs> physios will actually be their practitioners for the duration of the time that they're they're in the country and competing in the games. What they also do is there are some big um, national governing bodies that bring a lot of their practitioners with them or are able to bring more than one practitioners with them but but that's because they've got a lot of staff uh, sorry a lot of athletes and it may be that they're overrun or for example if you've got something like say badminton where you've got athletes competing at different times the sports specific physio or the physio that's looking after them may be at the competition venue but there may be other other athletes in that team that are back at the olympic village and may need some input so it's then that you actually call on the team, the HQ team physios to be able to deliver that. Um, so they, they provide assistance with the national governing bodies. Um, if you're a Team GB physio, you could be based in a number of places with Team GB as uh, the BOA have various sort of centres that they set up to allow the athletes to be able to achieve their full potential. 
in, in their performance. So you could be based in the Olympic Village, which I, I'm sure most of you will know about. That's the, the Games Village where everybody lives um, more often than not in, in newly developed um, housing estates that they, they then sell on, which is usually what happens certainly in the last few games. Um, and within that, you would set up a medical centre. So you may be in the Olympic Village. Most of the time, if you're in the Olympic Village, you would you would sleep and live in the Olympic Village. So you'd eat in the, in the dining hall with the rest of the athletes and team members, and your place of work would be the medical centre, but you'd have a bedroom somewhere in the accommodation block. On occasions, if they um, have got more staff than they have accreditations, then you may be living outside of the village in a hotel very near it and just come into the village on a day pass and come in, do your work, and then go back to your hotel. Now, the word accreditations that I've just um, just mentioned is very important in the amount of people that can come, can come into the Olympic village. So national governing bodies will qualify a certain number of athletes. So obviously, if it's hockey, which is the sport that I've worked most with, you qualify 18, 18 per gender, okay? With that comes the capacity to bring seven support staff. If you're someone like, um, say, wrestling, and you co- and you qualify two um, athletes, that may only give you the capacity to bring one support staff. So the, the number of athletes that you qualify is dependent on the number of um, support staff that you can bring. So for sports, for example, like football, I know football travel with, well, women's football travel with at least three physios when they go away. Now, when they qualify, it may be that they haven't got enough accredited spots for, their, for all of their physios to, to come because if three physios come, then it may mean that there won't be as many coaches and there may not be as many managers. And each sport can decide what staff they can actually bring within their accreditation. So sometimes they actually sleep outside in a hotel and then they just come in on a day pass and and do their work and then go home again. So that's an option sometimes with the headquarters staff as well. The, The hotel that you sleep in is not usually very far The other place that you may be positioned if you're part of the um, HQ staff is a preparation camp. Now, I think since 1986, I think it was the first preparation camp, the BOA have always held a preparation camp in the time leading up to the Olympic Village opening. And this allows the athletes and the teams to come into the country earlier. It allows them to acclimatise. It allows them to do quiet training And it allows them to concentrate on just their final preparation for their performance. And this has been one of the successes uh, of the BOA and why why our medal tally, one of the reasons why the medal tally has has remained so high. So a preparation camp is just basically a reproduction of what's in the Olympic Village. It can be very near the Olympic Village or it can be quite far away. So the preparation camp for Tokyo is is a 20 minute, half an hour train journey between the Olympic Village and we're in the uh, the preparation camp in Tokyo is is actually um, in a place called Yokohama and Kawasaki. So it's not far away. Um, In Rio, it was an hour and a half flight away. So it was quite far away. And, And what determines where it is, is basically the BOA look for the best facilities that they can offer. Because obviously with a preparation camp, not only do they want accommodation, they need to be able to provide all the training facilities. They need to provide all the nutrition. They need to provide, uh, you know, Olympic, uh, Olympic grade gyms and everything that would be in an Olympic village to allow these athletes to actually do their final preparations. And when I say quiet training, what I mean by quiet training is Team GB athletes will only have access to these these training facilities. So um, they're not trying to share it with every other nation in the Olympic Village, which will be looking for the same to try and train in the same um, venues that they're going to compete in. So it's, you know, it is it's it's a massive advantage if you can do your last week, two weeks of training in the country where you're going to compete in under the same environmental conditions. But obviously along with that is there is a need for the service delivery and that's where, again, Team GB will have a a headquarters and an an HQ physio service along with doctors, nutritionists, psychologists 
and the whole lot that will be in the village. So again, that may be somewhere where you are placed if you um, are recruited into the headquarters staff. And then the last place that you may be um, placed is something called a performance lodge. And again, through experience, the BOA will always have what they call a performance lodge. This is a place quite near the Olympic Village. It's usually, they usually take over a school, but it's a ring fence space that can be used for many levels. It can be used for extra training. Um, so there, you know, there's usually, they usually um, set up an Olympic gym. They usually have some area where there's, there's rehab. There's lots of areas for recovery. There's areas for more treatment. Um, and there's also areas that will enhance what's not in the village. For example, a swimming pool. Some villages have swimming pools. Some p villages don't. But the BOA will set up what they call a performance lodge so that it gives the athletes the capacity to be able to access facilities that they may normally use in terms of recovery and training. It also allows... Um, it also provides good nutrition. So if people are struggling with the village food, which some, some are... Um, and some do, it means that there's a good source of nutrition that they can go to. It also provides some space for people to work. For example, all the analysts are based in the performance lodge. So again, they don't need to be in the village. They live outside of the village. They don't take up accreditation numbers when they're not needed. And most importantly, it does provide a space for the athletes to meet their friends and family. Friends and family are not allowed in the athlete village. Um, so the only place you would be able to meet them will be outside somewhere in a cafe or a bar, but you don't need to because the BOA have a performance lodge and they basically are put on a waiting list, not a waiting list, uh, an entrance list, and the athletes can actually come and meet their friends and family in this safe, secure space. Um, and there is also, uh, you know, um, a physio service. So again, you may be in one of those venues um, delivering your service as part of the HQ team. Prior to going, and also, you know, in terms of developing the team, we do have face-to-face -face time, um, and we do try and find as much information out about each other as possible. Um, you know, what does a good day look like? What does a bad day look like? If a good day looks like this, you know, can we make it even better? If there's a bad, if a bad day looks like this, you know, what do you want us to do? Do you want us just to ignore you or do you want us to do something? Because I know personally, if I'm having a bad day, if somebody keeps saying, you're not right, you're not right, what can I do? It makes my day even worse. So, you know, if people know that um, and you've talked openly about your with your team, then you can actually act accordingly. Um, it also means that you can get to know potentially who you're going to be sharing with and, and try and get to know them better. Um, and it also means that you can get to impart information on what you need to do to, to look after yourself. And, and that may be, you know, a bit like, as Liam mentioned, you do need to look after yourself. The days are long, not always busy, but long. Um, I'll go into what a day looks like. But, um, you know, you do need to look after yourself. You, you know, what, what do you need? Now, I know what I need, but it may be something very different to what somebody else needs. But, you know, if you know that they need to go on a run every morning, then if you're, if you're the one doing their scheduling, um, you don't put them on the early morning shift so they can't go on a run, or you don't if you, if you don't have to. So it's just getting to know you, but also in that period of preparation, you are given sports that you'll be looking after. And that will be a mixture of sports. It'll be a mixture of sports where you're the sole practitioner that you're delivering services to, or it may and it may be a sport where you may be the point of contact for an existing sports-specific practitioner um, so rather than everybody going to the one person, the lead physio, everybody has their fair of sports and they're the people they go to. And that might be to arrange ice baths, soft tissue, um, massage or availability for um, them to see doctors if they haven't bought their own doctor. It could be anything. So you'll be allocated sports that you lead on prior to the games. And one of the reasons why um, they do this is so that you get a chance one, to try and gen up on the sport and trying to gain as much information. So there is no expectation that you're the world expert on every Olympic sport. There are lots of transferable skills, um, but it will give you a little bit of preparation time to talk to people that work in the sport, possibly meet the team, the athletes and the staff that are going out there. You 
unlikely to have the chance to go to a competition with them just because um, it, it usually is, is just, uh, you know, you can't do it because they've already got their own staff that go. Um, but it's to try and pre prepare you as much as you can. You'll, you'll, do, you'll do clinic cover and you'll do venue, venue and training competition cover. So with the sports that you're the only practitioner, um, you will go to their training venue and you'll, you'll, do, um, you'll be there for their training. You'll also be there for the competition, which is very exciting. Um, but also you, you are likely to do a shift, shifts in the clinic. And it is just a straightforward clinic like most other clinics in the country, except that you get all these Olympic athletes in, which is very exciting. And you have to try and make sure that you don't ask them very you know, stupid questions in front of them. Um, you're rostered on. So you actually, you actually do probably two out of three shifts a day. Um, there's very little time off and that's why it's very important when you do get time off that you make the best of it. Um, I have never had a full day off in a multi-sport games. I've had the occasional half day, um, but I've never had a full day off. It would be very unusual to work, uh, to have a full day off. Um, so you usually, as I say, usually do two out of three shifts. Some of those, hopefully they're consecutive so the clinic would open 7 a.m. and close these at 11 p.m. Um, and that can be arranged. You can have earlier appointments arranged and you can have later appointments arranged depending on the sport. So, for example, basketball, they always have evening games, so they always finish a lot later. So, it, you know, if there's some basketball need that they need to come in, then we'll actually keep the clinic open later. Um, if there's an early morning sport or a sport that has to leave early because their venue is is a little bit further away and they need to somebody see somebody at 6 a.m., then that can be arranged. But the normal day, normal working day, is 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., of which you will do two-thirds of that. And it could be the first two shifts. It could be the last two shifts. Occasionally, it's the first shift and the last shift. So, you know, you might get a little bit of downtime in the afternoon, but but other than that, you've, you're working at the beginning and at the end of the day. And as I say, you work continuously through the games. So once your sport is finished, and usually what happens, if you're given two lead sports, you'll be given one that competes at the beginning of the competition period because the Olympics is over two weeks. And then once they finish competing, you'll be given a, a sport that is competing at the latter half of the games. Um so, so that you, you mix between sports. So even if your specific sports are finished, you will still be doing shifts within the clinic because the clinic will continue to be manned. So that's what a, a Team GB HQ physio looks like. Now, a Team GB sports-specific physio is also another physio that is part of the Team GB, and they travel to the games specifically with a team or a sport, and it's usually their full-time day job. So, it, you know, I worked in hockey for um, 17 years. So I, I went to a few Olympic Games and I worked predominantly for, for the men and then uh, latterly with the women. But so I would be the physio that, that goes with the hockey. So basically you just treat your team. So it's a bit like a normal working day at the English Institute of Sport or the Welsh Institute of Sport or the Scottish Institute of Sport or at a national governing body. Um, they provide services in HQ. So all of the national governing body sport specific physios can use the HQ setup. They discourage people from treating in their bedrooms, which is what people usually do in a, in a sort of a single um, sport championship. The bedrooms usually are so small, you can't fit a physio couch in it anyway. So, um, that's not a difficult decision to make, but working within headquarters has many, many advantages. You, you know, you're, you're with other practitioners, most of whom you will know at, to some level. You've obviously got the support of the headquarters staff if you're struggling or you're not feeling on top of your game that day and you, you need to go and lie down or you've got loads of athletes in that have all got little niggles. You can ask them for some help. So you've got that support and you've obviously got the sort of inter into sport, you know, um, support of, of other people in a similar position. There's as many a time that I've been in headquarters and you've been treating your athletes and you're looking around as you do and you've got a track and field physio or you've got, you know, a taekwondo physio doing something. You think, oh, 
I wonder what they're doing. So you go and ask and, you know, it, it, lots of exchange of ideas and there's lots of things that you can, that you can transfer into your own practice. I've certainly used some of the techniques that they, they use for wound care in cycling. I've, I've used them in, in hockey because we get similar wounds and it's silly things like that, that you don't think about. But when you're, you're sit, you're standing next to a couch where there's a cycling physio looking after all these wounds from the um, velodrome and you think, Oh, wow wonder why they're using that because we could use that in hockey or we could do this so it's a really good atmosphere and environment to work in you're unlike as a sport specific physio you're unlikely to work with any other sport because you're only there to work with your sport um and again a bit like the headquarters nine times out of ten you stay with the team in the village um but on on occasions you might have to stay outside and come in on a day pass but most of the time uh you stay in the village um, and when the competition finishes, your work finishes because you're only there for that competition. So um, some sport specific physios. So, for example, swimming um, finishes in the at the end of the first week. Um, there's a thing where you can actually change. You can swap people on accreditations. So the athletes have the right to stay in the village for the whole of the games, but the staff don't. So as long as there's some staff left behind to make sure their athletes are behaving, um, some staff are actually asked to leave the village and are put up in a hotel or go home because their accreditation can be handed on to a sport that comes in at the latter half. So even though your competition is finished, it may be that you can't stay in the village and you may either have to go to a hotel outside the village or you actually are, are sent home. Harsh, but um, it does happen. So that's the second type of physio position and then the third one is the organizing committee physio now as i said there's a lot more opportunities um for this because of uh, of all the multi-sport games that have been held in the uk um it's a volunteer recruitment you do go through a recruitment process but it tends to be remote interviews um, they look at your cvs um you tend to be appointed to either work in a clinic or at a venue and again um in a Commonwealth, not in a Commonwealth Olympics, um, Paralympics, there is something called a polyclinic in the in the village, which is like a mini hospital. So it has all the specialties. So it has physio, soft tissue, it has radiology, scanning, pharmacy, family planning, um, ophthalmology, dentistry, primary care. has has a, It has beds, you know, that you can stay in overnight. Um, so it's like a mini hospital. Um, so the organising committee has to man that. So it may be that you're put into the polyclinic. It may be that you are providing physio services at a venue. Um, and basically you're providing the physio service to all of the nations that are participating in that competition. You are unlikely to see any GB, phys uh, any GB athletes because GB tends to be as independent as possible and self-reliant as possible. And you're unlikely to see any of the bigger nations where they are doing exactly the same. It's mainly the nations that don't have the capacity to provide their own medical support. Um, and you, you can get all sorts, absolutely all sorts coming through your door um, there. And, you know, lots of, lots of sign language because they don't speak English and I don't speak any other language than English, but some people may even argue I don't speak English, but, so lots of it's good fun can be a bit challenging um there obviously are interpreters there um and obviously their their description of injuries and stuff you know it could be that they've had lots and lots of chronic injuries you you usually see a lot of chronic injuries because they've never had the capacity to have things treated so they're actually really you can make really good gains with that because you don't actually have to um you know treat them or singing or dancing because they just haven't had the treatment most organising committees, when you volunteer, ask you to volunteer for a minimum. And the ones that I've done have been a minimum of five to eight days. And the reason that is, is, is basically finance because you're provided with uniform and you're provided with food. And so if you've got one person for five days, it's going to be a lot cheaper than five people for five days in terms of uniform. So there's usually a minimum number that they like you to uh, volunteer for but there is no maximum number. But bearing in mind you're volunteering, 
um, you know, that that may be um, what causes you to, to stick a, a smaller number. And you're rostered onto a daily shift. You usually do one shift. It's usually a six to eight hour shift and you usually stay in one place. Um, so um, you just come in, you do your work, you go home. So, but but the recruitment um, are diff- at different levels and a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it is mapped to the ACP SEM levels. So they'll look at that. Um, I certainly know when I was recruiting for, T, for, for HQ members um, at the Commonwealth, I, I would be mapping it to silver stroke gold. Um, you don't have to have it, but it is mapped to. So it's worth even if you, even I'm not discouraging you, discouraging you to go not to not apply, but it is a value to know what they are because all of the recruitment is mapped to it. Um, so there are three types of physios. Okay, a day in the life can be very varied. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to talk you through, I'm going to talk you through a headquarters physio role. Okay, so as I've said before, two to three, two to three out, two out of three shifts. Okay, if you're allocated to a sport that's training, you'll go along with the sport to their training venue. Um, as I've said before, you have to fit into the team very very quickly. Your communication needs to be very flexible because you're communicating with athletes that you may very know very little of and you're obviously communicating to members of staff and coaches that they may not know you. Uh, they may be used to another physio and you've just stepped in for the competition. So you do have to be quite flexible. You do have to be aware of how they, how they like to be communicated. And if you're unsure, then you, you ask it's the best best thing to do. If you're unsure about something with the athletes, you ask. I've not found any athlete that doesn't like talking about their own sport. Um, and you just admit, you know, I noticed this. What does this mean? Or I noticed that you do this in warm-up. Why do you do that? They love talking about their sport. And, and coaches love showing you their sport. They're, I've had a fencing lesson. I've had a wrestling lesson. Um, I've, I've had a trampoline in lesson because they love talking and teaching you about their sport. So take advantage of it. It just increases your exposure to various experiences. So you would um, you would know that the night before what bus you're catching. So the buses are go from a central point where all the athletes go on. Um, you know where they're meeting. You may meet them for breakfast and have breakfast with them and then go along to the transport mall beforehand. It may be that you have to just pick up some physio stuff from the physio room. So it may be that you meet them at the transport mall. So you'll go with them as a mini team to the training venue. Whilst you're at their training venue, whilst they're warming up, it gives you a chance to actually look at the venue, look at the medical room, look at what's there, look at the emergency procedure, check with the sort of the organising committee medical team, um, you know, where the exit levels are, where the ambulances go, where are the defibs. So it gives you a chance to do an assessment and a recce of the venue of uh, which they're competing. And you may assume that there's a certain level of medical um, provision there, but never assume. Always find out. Always make sure that you know where the ambulance is going to be. Always make sure that you know where the paramedics are going to stand on the mat. And also make sure that you know the rules of the sport. It will be awful for you to go onto a mat and get the athlete disqualified because you're not allowed on the mat um, just because you hadn't asked that question. So that, you know, that is really important. So it, so whilst they're training, it gives you an opportunity to look at, you know, the nuances of their sport, the rules of their sport, and also you know, assess the the venue and where to get things, where to go, who's going to be in the medical room. Do you know them? Do they speak English? You know, if you run out of strapping, is there something where you can get some strapping from or, you know, where do you get ice from, that sort of stuff. So it gives you a great chance to recce and also to, to look at the sport. Um, am I running out of time, Carl? Okay. Oh, Whiz through quickly. So that would be if you if you go if you actually go to a venue and training venue. Obviously, competition day. You know you've got your rules and regulations, um, and you would know them by now because you would have actually gone to a um, a training session with them. If you're in the clinic, 
it's basically whatever comes through the door. So you could you could see a fence and one for one treatment and a wrestler for the next, but it's whatever comes through the door. And you may be doing, you know, routine treatment, but you also may be looking after them in the ice bath or putting recovery boots on them or giving them soft tissue massage or any, or anything like that. The car, the picture shows there's a picture there of a physio couch in a in a horse stall, which is where I used to do the treatment treatment when I was looking after the equestrian in Sydney and that's where we um, we set up the, the, the sort of the physio room in a um, in a horse horse stall next to the horses. Clinical stuff is probably the tip of the iceberg there's many other things that you'll be asked to do and put your hand to doing it you could be doing morning monitoring for hydration you could be setting up equipment you could be putting you know recovery boots on you could be setting up or cleaning or supervising ice baths. You could be the coffee monitor or you could actually be the receptionist for the day. So it's, you know, you do need to be flexible. You need to be happy to put your hand to everything because it's not busy all of the time. Um, as I said, they're long days, but sometimes they're not busy. So sometimes you're in the clinic and there's not too much to do. Um, and and you can't go away from the clinic because you're on duty. So, you know, there is lot, often lots of CPD done. There's lots of things that you practice with each other or, um, you know, you have the opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, there, there is a learning opportunity. It's not all work, lots of play. And I must admit that um, my travels have allowed me to do lots of silly things and be exposed to lots of things. So saw the Great Wall of China when I was in Beijing unsuccessfully paddleboarded in uh, Australia. You go to the opening ceremony, which is a fantastic opportunity. You're part of the team and you march round. So fantastic. Some of the best experiences. Um, the one with me when my glasses on is I watched the opening ceremony in London because we didn't march. Um, and the one in the middle with me with a very scary face is I watched the Olympic final in Rio when the women won the gold. Um, and that was the team I'd been looking after. So, you know, it gives you an opportunity to do a lot of things that you would otherwise not on top of, you know, a great experience within, um, you know, within your clinical life. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. Again, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Liam, for I think giving us insights into two different environments within sport. So there are definitely some similarities of themes kind of picked up in terms of knowledge and the environment and the context and things, but obviously some differences there. So thank you. We have lots of questions. So um, I'm going to do my best to ask as many as possible to both of you. Um, so we'll kind of go for short answers where possible, um, just to allow us to get through as many questions as possible. I might chip in as well um, with the odd answer. And I know just some of you might think all oh, my questions been answered. So I know I've answered and Sean Knott, who um, is the chair of our education committee, has kind of answered a few questions already. So um, just because we thought we could answer those because they're slightly maybe less related to the topic of the evening. So we're going to start with the first one um, and I'll have it over to Liam initially and then Laura you can and chip in so how do you go about volunteering slash shadowing at clubs so that came from Louise but has been liked by quite a lot of people what's your yeah. top tip Liam good question um I think it's I think you've got to be a badger you've got to like well what I did is I, what, what area I was in I would look at what sports teams were around that area Try and find the contact details for people. Um, it might be that in your area, there's loads of really good rugby teams or loads of really good, um, say, there's a judo centre. Um, so look at what's around your area and then send some emails. And I used to think if they had like a good looking website and, and they look quite a professional outfit, they're probably going to have somebody that's um, that you could work with. And I think a big thing is trying to find somebody that, is already working there as a physio that you can work under rather than trying to go in and lead something as a, as a newly experienced or student physio. Um, so yeah, have a look online, do some research. Most, a lot of people don't reply, unfortunately, but you, you might get one in a handful that do and, and follow that. 
Cool. Thank you. And Laura, anything you, any top? No, the, the only thing I would add to that, I, I totally agree with that, is um, choose a sport, preferably that you don't mind watching. If you choose something that you're not going to like, enjoy watching, then you might not enjoy the experience. So, but again, as Liam said, try and find a, a, a club that have, have got physios. You're not going in as their main practitioner because you're not going to learn from that. You, you need to be supervised and work with somebody. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And I suppose my other probably top tip would be when you're kind of getting in touch with people, don't aim too big, kind of say, can I come and shadow you for an evening or aim small and then see what that creates in terms of opportunities rather than trying to say, can I come and shadow you every week for the next hour or long, aim small and then it often opens doors once you've kind of got your foot in or things like that. So thank you. Similar question. Let's go with Laura. Well, actually, I'm going to say something first. So it's the question is, what's the best way to go about finding a mentor? Good question, Sally. Again, lots of people have ticked yes, and that is a challenge. And I would say that as, an, as, as a group, Physios in Sport, we are doing our best to try and promote how we can go about do this. But I would certainly say the CSP recently have developed their own mentoring kind of program that you can access via their website and sport is one of the options on it so um, we are encouraging our members to try and sign up as mentors um, but so that is one place to now start to look at but I'm going to go Laura first and a top tip on finding a mentor um, they don't have to be the best thing in sport you can have a mentor that is is somebody that is is only just a couple of years in front of you in terms of exposure you don't have to some have somebody that's all singing and all dancing so again don't aim too high um you know a good mentor that's local as well because if if you're a remote then the only way you're going to communicate is zoom or you know via email whereas if if somebody you work with or somebody that works at a club near you you're more likely to be able to meet them for a coffee or even meet them in their place of work and get some shadowing at the same time um, i hand that over to liam although liam's probably going to get about 60 emails because he's handed out his email tonight <laughs> mentor. but liam what's your top tip i would agree exactly with that i would say again don't aim high too high because often the people that are england football physio don't have the time, unfortunately. Um, and potentially, your, your physios in sport, rep, if you go on the website, you'll see that. And their job will be to to help you find somebody or, or, or mentor you. So I'd say that would be my top tip with that. Cool. Thank you. Um, slightly less career-related, but I'll go with this one. Um, top tip on any recommendations for furthering S&C knowledge as a BSC physio? Liam, go on, you go first this time. Um, so you, two ways of looking at it. I think you could do, um, if you're already a physio student, then obviously sports science, um, you could look at a master's uh, further down the line, sports science, strength conditioning. We could do some of the UK strength conditioning association courses. Uh, physios and sport do a nice clinical reasoning and exercise course. Or you could make a connection with an S2C coach or if you're at a club or a team that's got an SNC coach, often the, the best learnings I've had have been talking through colleagues that um, I work with day to day. Yeah, cool. And I'd probably concur with Liam on the working with people and learning from people you're around in that environment, definitely. Um, Laura, did you want to say anything? No, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. It, it, it's, it's, yeah, rather than sort of, if you want to do formal courses, fantastic. But learning on the job or or looking, you know, if you have something specific that you want to look at, looking at what some of the literature is around and sort of just asking questions on the authors um, or finding out where the authors are based and, and approaching them from that, that point of view would be a good way as well, as well as the other stuff that's been mentioned. Yeah, cool. I'm going to say, because we're talking careers, um, start with Liam. And the, um, what's your career plan for, say, the next five years? Yeah, I saw that question. I was hoping I might dodge that. Um, yeah, good question. I, 
I did always used to say I'd love to work for England and nationally, football, rugby, cricket, and doing Olympic Games. Like they're the things I'd love to do. Um, so it would be one of those. I think I'd like to work in a an in, in, international capacity. I think. Okay, cool. Laura, what's your career plan for the next five years? Um, my career plan for the next five years. Um, so I have started to branch out a little bit into being slightly more less clinical. So certainly the, the role I had in Rio and the role I have got in uh, in Tokyo is, a, is as a performance service manager um, at the prep camp. So basically what that means is that I manage all of the performance services at the prep camp for Team GB. So S&C, nutrition, we, we've got our own chef. Um, physio, doctors, um, psych, um, and sports scientists. So I'm my career plan is going a little bit further along those lines, so more logistic and strategic than clinical. Although my day to day job is still mainly clinical, so I think that's probably where where I'm going in the next next five years. Yeah, I think it's great to point out that I think physios and their skill set does lend itself to non-clinical roles as well in sport. And there's definitely growing examples of that. So um, it can be a very varied career option. It doesn't it's not all just clinical. So it's definitely a good point. Um, I'm just having a flick through some of the questions. Um, I quite like this question. Apologies if I'm missing yours. Um so it's from an anonymous attendee, but is there anything you would have told yourself as a newly qualified physio? And I assume I am going to say in relation to your kind of sports physio career. Laura, let's go with you first. Is there anything you would have told yourself as a newly qualified physio? Um, probably don't, don't get head up with the small stuff. Look at the bigger picture. You know, if, if it doesn't work out one way, then there are, you know, as, as Liam has said, there are many ways to skin a cat. So just because you're doing something, um, you know, don't get hit up if it doesn't at first work out. So just just keep going. Um, I w- and also just continue to have fun. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, then, then don't do it. You, you've got to enjoy it because, you know, as we've both said, they're long hours, they're antisocial hours. You give up a lot. And if you're going to resent that, then there's no point in doing it. Cool. Liam? Um, I would say in, enjoy the journey and don't rush. So I think when I first qualified, I, I wanted to be England physio, England cricket, England football, working the Olympics now, straight away. And I think you, yeah, I think it's really easy to be drawn into that and want it instantly. And I think as a so instant we want things straight away and I think being able to appreciate the don't have anything at all really and and skills and things you'll learn along the way are so important and trying to miss those I think you miss a lot I think yeah that would be what I would say cool now I'm aware of time I'm going to go for a couple more questions so I'm going to get an apology out early that we're not going to answer all of them I don't think um, but there have been a couple of questions around Covid so I just wonder if you would both kind of give a, a brief answer of how has Covid impacted your work or changed your work because obviously you work in different settings so Laura how has Covid impacted you? Um, so the current team that I work with are the development men for Great Britain Hockey and we are classed under the elite banner. So um, when sport came back after the first lockdown, um, we have been able to continue training and we will be continuing training through in se- through second lockdown. But what it does mean is that obviously all of our athletes have to be screened before we go onto the pitch. So they have to answer a, a certain number of questions and have their temperature taken. Um, We've had many, many athletes that have had to self-isolate us because most of my athlete population are at university. So, you know, they we've had loads of self-isolation and they've they've been really good. No, nobody has come with any symptoms that could be attributed to COVID that we've had to turn around and send home because we have said we will be very conservative. And if there's anything that we suspect, they're on their way home. Um, for the initial part, when we went back, I wasn't allowed to treat anybody. Um, hockey deemed that it was um, emergency treatment only, so it was only l- limb or life-threatening treatment that we could give. Me standing on the sideline in an apron 
a pair of gloves and a mask is very inconvenient, um, but it has to be done um, and I'm getting used to it and I'm getting used to the visor. Um, so there are adaptions, but the, the important thing is, is that we're safely training um, and, and that's a lot better than some sports. So th there have been some changes. Well, Liam, how about in your football academy? Um, so we... We have temperature. Um, we have questionnaires, symptom questionnaires that everybody has to fill in before they come to work, both as staff and players. Um, so we need to make sure nothing comes up with those, and then temperature checking of, of the players, and making sure the coaches have got all the PPE, us wearing all the PPE. Um, lots more meetings online, so we're only doing like essential stuff at the training ground, and the rest of our role is at home. Um, so it's yeah, very different, really. Cool. Um, let me see. Um, question I'm going to go for Laura on this one. So I'll go one for Laura, one for Liam, and then we might have to call it a day then. So question is, how did you balance working full time and then taking time to work on the Olympics as well? Was the question, Laura. So did you kind of want to touch on the balance potentially yeah. or how that worked for you? Um, it, it's sort of fitting it in. It, it is it is a balanced, tricky situation. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, if if you're in a clinical role, which certainly I was, sort of the first Olympics and the last few, um, I've been more strategic. Um, you take you take time off. You take leave. Uh, the Olympic role is voluntary, so you don't get paid for it. So it's um, you know you to attend meetings. You take leave. Um, to be fair, the, the Zoom generation has allowed us to have more meetings without needing to take leave because you can do them in the evening without actually going to places. So that is a real positive. Um, but it, it is a balancing one. But but the people that are working for the BOA that this is their full-time job, do realise that we're doing this in our free time. So, you know, that there is an, there is a certain amount of pressure, but it's if you just say, look, I am so swamped, I can't attend this meeting, they'll accept that and they'll, you know, send you the, send you the minutes and they'll, you know, they'll have a discussion about what needs to happen. But it is a tricky one. It is a really tricky one. Um, and, you know, many a, many a night I've looked at standard operating procedures and things like that after a normal day's work or even when I'm overseas with the hockey and I've got to look at them, you know, rather than sitting down reading a magazine, I'm reading a standard operating procedure. So it's you just you just have to fit it in. Cool. And a similar themed question, just probably to finish off for you, Liam, is around um, balancing your day job and doing your master's. Any kind of comments around that or advice to people? Um, yeah, um, tough, I think. It's, you've just got to be organised and try and set out a bit of time every week for it and commit to that. Um, just make the most of opportunities. If, if you're on an away trip, the bus journey can be a good chance to do it. Um, I think trying to just be disciplined, set some time aside for it each week and, and don't get down if you miss stuff one week. The good thing about that Masters that I'm doing is quite flexible. So it's tough, but you've just got to, I think, get a routine as best as possible yeah cool um i think uh i'm gonna go one more question each and then we're definitely gonna go um liam do you yeah. is it someone this is from ethan who's a big saints fan so we're gonna go to you on this one do you find taking a more hands-off or hands-off approach when managing treating athletes and a short answer yeah um i would say with the younger people definitely hands-off um, I think try and promote good habits and uh, with the older ones is probably a bit more hands-on. Cool and last question for Laura how do you deal with targets or performance measures within sport and potentially being vulnerable job-wise if for example a player doesn't recover as well or is prone to injury? Yeah not an easy way to be a short answer but <laughs> try a short answer. Say that again. <laughs> um, how do you deal with the, I suppose, the challenge of targets or performance measures within sport and in your role being vulnerable job-wise if the player doesn't recover as quickly or they get re-injured again? And is it your fault as the physio or not? 
uh, fortunately, it's not, it's not my fault as a physio if they get re-injured or rehab. Um, it, it's, a t- it's a team rehabilitation, so there is never one person that's blamed. So my, my job, I obviously have my own uh, targets, um, but they're not, they're not put down as, you know, 70% of the team have to be fit all the time. We don't have those targets. Each athlete has their own um, interpersonal development and we are part of that and we work with our athletes to try and help them um, achieve that. For example, you know, robustness, flex- flexibility, that sort of stuff. So we know what they are and we work with them. Um, that, yeah, yeah. My targets aren't, you know, seven people have to be fit out of ten. I don't have those sort of targets, um, and it's and it's always teamwork. It's never one person. And that probably is the the challenge of the culture of sport. And mm. but actually, kind of the examples I think you and Leon have talked about, or good practice in sport, is that there's very much a teamwork environment and there isn't a no blame thing it's everyone together so in terms of injury in an ideal world it doesn't just fall on the 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 doc or the physio it's actually the team approach so I'm going to stop the questions there I'm going to share one more slide in a second take this opportunity to thank Laura and Liam again for their time their presentations um, and to hopefully answering your questions and I know we haven't answered all your questions but hopefully the ones we have have probably touched on some of the questions um, that we haven't got to answer if you really do have a burning question please do email us at the ACPSEM Um, so just go for admin at um, and then use our address and the email address is very much on the website so that's admin at physios and sport dot i should know org i think but look on the website um, and do the admin at address um, and i'm just going to share one screen uh temporarily again one slide just to flag is just to kind of say keep your eyes peeled because we are in the covid times looking at um, moving our introduction to sport course that we used to run in person um to online so in 2021 keep your eyes out um that we will be looking at a design where there'll be presentations presentations that you can watch in your own time um, and there'll be a follow-up kind of live Q&A session with some of the, the a, a panel based on the the presentations that you've watched so we're looking at launching that so and that will cover different topics to do with some of the things spoken about today such as anti-doping recovery um, kind of reflective practice return to sport things so all kind of links to what we've heard about today and if anyone is already going to vid- for the virtual Physio UK, which is next week, where Sean and I and Nikki Phillips are running a networking session on the Friday morning. Um, I think it's at 11.30. Um, so that's Friday the 13th. So you, obviously, if you're already booked onto the conference, um, you're welcome to come along to that networking session as well um, in the morning. Otherwise, it's definitely time to go and grab your hot chocolate or whatever you're going to do this evening. Um, Thank you again to Laura and Liam. And I hope this evening has been useful for you. And like I said, do get in contact with us. And obviously, thanks again to Physique for helping to facilitate this. And have a good night, everyone.